Is it looks like he's going to be over the winter that he may be our January uh, speaker. So I'm, uh, I will have, once I learn how to use the new <laughs> website, I'll have the details up about that and the other speakers that I've got on the schedule for coming up. Some familiar, familiar old friends in there and some new people. So um, let's see. Uh, All right, um, just reminders for the people, uh, people here in purpose, people here in person, please remember to, to mute, to turn off your phones or keep your phones silenced. People in Zoom, uh, please remember to keep your microphones off so we can't hear what's going on at your house. Um, and uh, anyone who has questions, uh, we'll try to save them for the end. Um, after Chad has finished his talk, if you're on Zoom, you have the chat window there, so you can post your questions in the chat. And uh, one of us here in person will read off the questions toward the end and let Chad address them. So um, let's see. And I think other than that, we can go ahead and I can talk about tonight. And all right, are we, Derek, is the recording going on? Mm -hmm. Okay. Great, so everybody gets, gets to see me stumbling around and forgetting what I'm supposed to say. So um, tonight, now, so many of you remember a few of the new people probably don't know my predecessor in this job, Jeff LeBaron, um, who is the national coordinator of the Christmas bird count and uh, worked for National Audubon Society. And when he was in this, in this position of lining up speakers, Usually every year or so, he'd bring in one of his National Audubon Society colleagues to do a presentation. And so uh, over the summer, I inquired with Jeff and said, hey, do you have any, you know, is there anyone uh, at National Audubon yet who would recommend to, as a speaker to come talk to the club? So, and he put me in, in touch with Chad Whitgo, who's our, our uh, presenter for tonight. Um, Chad is a longtime uh, field ornithologist um, he's worked on Project Puffin about two decades ago and many other things between then and now. Um, and at the mo and his current position with National Audubon Society, he is uh, avian, senior avian coordinator for the Migratory Bird Initiative. Um, and he's going to tell us more about that tonight. And so why don't I turn it over to Chad. Everybody can hear me okay? The microphone? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, thank you for the warm introduction. Thank you for, for having me. I do just want to say right off the bat, I'm glad I'm speaking now uh, ahead of Scott Whitensall. Um, and those are some big shoes to, to fill. Um, so, yeah, as was mentioned, um, I work for the National Audubon Society and the Migratory Bird Initiative. And tonight I'm going to talk to you a little bit about. The Migratory Bird Initiative, or as we sometimes refer to as MBI, you might hear me say those terms interchangeably, so that's what that means. So I'll talk to you about MBI and our Bird Migration Explorer. So just real quick, a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm a lifelong birder. I've been birding since I was about three years of age. I'm originally from the Hudson Valley, so not too far from here. Uh, I have done, as Josh mentioned, uh, field ornithology, uh, pretty much coast to coast across the country, in about seven different states. And I am the uh, founder and director of the board for the Antioch Bird Club. So I have some, some local roots here in New England uh, with that association. Um, and as is listed here, I am a senior coordinator in avian biology for MBI and Audubon's national science team. Uh, I also work uh, as a volunteer science uh, advisor for BirdNote. So if anyone is familiar with BirdNote programming, uh, I help out with some of that as well on the slide. So here's the agenda for this evening. Uh, I'm going to give an overview of the Migratory Bird Initiative, uh, as well as an overview of our Bird Migration Explorer. If technology works as I intend, uh, we'll do a live demo of the Bird Migration Explorer to kind of help put it into a uh, live perspective, what this tool is, and to give each of you some confidence in being able to take this 
uh, home with you, as it were, to be able to work with the explorer on your own uh, to gain some insights about our migratory birds. And then uh, we'll take some Q&A at the end. So one of the things that's really amazing about our migratory birds is that they connect us to faraway places across the world. Massachusetts is no different, of course. And as many of you know, Massachusetts is filled with a wide array of bird life, including some amazing migratory species. And as the presentation goes on this evening, I'll help show you what the Bird Migration Explorer can, can kind of um, maybe illuminate uh, how Massachusetts is connected to some of these places across the hemisphere. Uh, just as a preview, uh, all these lines that you see on the screen, these are all individual pathways of tracked birds. So birds that have had some type of tracking device placed on them by researchers. So you can see science has shown us uh, clearly how migratory birds cross places like New England, Massachusetts, and Cleveland. So let's do a little deep dive into Audubon's Migratory Bird Initiative. So what is the impetus for Audubon's MBI? Well, it should probably come as no surprise for many of you here that our migratory birds are being lost at an alarming rate. So in 2019, in a seminal paper published in Science by Rosenberg and others, uh, they detailed how nearly 3 billion birds are no longer on our landscape as compared to 1970. So really drastic declines over the last 50 years, essentially uh, within the lifetime for many people. Audubon's own uh, research has shown uh, in a report that came out in 2020, uh, with work done in 2019 as well, that nearly Nearly 400 birds are on the brink of extinction or some type of massive range shift uh, due to climate change, unless there is some type of, of mitigation uh, put in place. So, <clears throat> our birds are being lost at an alarming rate. As I said, nearly 3 billion birds lost in 50 years. Uh, and this equates to about one out of every four migratory birds. Of the 3 billion, I believe the paper details nearly two and a half billion are from our migratory species. So why is that alarming? Well, birds tell us about the health of our environment. We're all familiar with this concept, right? That the canary in the coal mine, right? There used to you know, be miners that would take these birds down in cages and, and those birds uh, would be an indication of the, the health of the environment around the miners. So if something happened to the bird, it was an indication that the miners needed to, to evacuate the mine that they were in. Uh, and the same is true for our birds in the wild spaces around us. They are literally uh, the canaries in the coal mine when it comes time to what's happening in the planet around us. Uh, and this is because birds are incredible ecosystem indicators. So what happens to birds, uh, you know, in short order is something that we can measure and see that there's something happening in the environment around us. It's also important to realize, as is exemplified in this quote here, that if you take care of the birds, there's a good chance you're going to take care of a lot of the big problems in the world. So, by protecting birds in the places they need, we also protect the places that people need and other wildlife need. You know, clean air, clean water, wild spaces that benefit birds, other wildlife, also benefit humans alike. So how do we go about doing this? Well, protecting our migratory birds really does require us working across the hemisphere. Um, here you can see an example map taken from our Bird Migration Explorer of Swainson's hawks, uh, migratory paths that have been tracked out of the American West down in South America. And you can see that these birds are migrating over vast distances covering many geopolitical boundaries. And you know, there's this phrase that says, if you're going to raise a child, it takes a village, right? Well, we believe that if we're gonna protect our migratory birds, it takes a hemisphere. So it takes a lot of hemispheric work Cross boundaries with many different entities to protect these species. 
And more than half of our migratory birds that we see in our communities spend more than half of the year outside of the United States. We have a very uh, kind of northern hemisphere, boreal hemisphere uh, bias. We like to think of these as our birds, but the truth is, is many of them are here for only a short period of time. The rest of the time, they're in other places. And these are birds that other people, other cultures, other locations are experiencing as well. The good news is that advances in migration science and technology help us to understand bird migration to achieve impactful conservation. Now, it's not just uh, putting on new tracking devices, uh, which is always kind of important in, in this realm of science. Uh, it's also some of the analyses that happen too. There's, there's, new, there's new ways to analyze the data that's already been collected or is being collected currently. So the synthesis of this data uh, reveals new insights in many times. You know, in many ways, that synthesis is coming about because there is now a lot of effort in putting in more data types, disparate data types together under one, <laughs> one roof to help people better understand what's happening. What this does is this helps us visualize the scale of the problem, it helps us to understand also the scale of the solution. So what is the vision of the Migratory Bird Initiative? So through MBI, Audubon seeks to secure the future of our migratory species in the Western Hemisphere, done through four kind of main uh, avenues. It includes identifying the places that these migratory birds uh, rely on in order to thrive, protecting those places that matter most, uh, particularly on a multi-species level, reducing threats, and of course, engaging people in the wonder of migration. Tonight's talk would certainly fall into that category as well. And I certainly hope that by the end of this uh, presentation tonight, that some of you will have an increased sense of joy and wonder about our migratory species. So how does MDI work? Well, it works by consolidating millions of data shared by hundreds of scientists and institutions to reveal the most complete understanding of where, when, and how we need to act across the hemisphere to protect our migratory birds. And this was done through extraordinary partnership. We're kind of in a new era right now where conservation uh, is happening across lines, not only geopolitical lines, but also institutional lines. So for uh, the Migratory Bird Initiative, um, particularly in the development of the uh, Bird Migration Explorer, uh, we partnered with science, conservation, and technology organizations, as well as hundreds of scientists, institutions, and agencies. Uh, up here is a list of our primary founding partners uh, for the Bird Migration Explorer, as well as some technology uh, partners as well that helped make it happen. So the Migratory Bird Initiative is really based on data. It's data and scientifically driven. Um, that data comes in, kind of takes two paths. One path was used primarily for things like the Bird Migration Explorer, this visualization of bird migration that we put together. It's also used for some of our conservation um, analyses that we do with some of our applied conservation work. So what are some of the, the, uh, the data that comes into this? Well, one of the main ones that you guys are probably familiar with are banding data. As I show you the different types of uh, data that, that we have used, um, please note in the upper portion of the screen uh, a visual representation of what that data really means. So uh, for banding data, you know, where you put a band or a ring on a bird, that bird is released. Sometimes that bird is re-encountered elsewhere. And so you can say the bird went from point A to point B. We can draw a straight line and say these two points are connected, but we don't necessarily know the path that they took in between, right? Uh, and then you're going to see a, a series of straight lines and curved lines to represent the different types of connections that we can infer, and also the thicknesses of the lines and the dots help to show how precise these are versus how imprecise these data types can be. And I'll talk about these as we go on. 
So banding data was a big uh, portion of the data sets that came in, as well as using uh, genetic data. So we got some data from uh, the Bird Genoscape project. Uh, again, with Genoscape data, genetics data, you can say essentially uh, where a bird came from or where a bird went, you know, if you're capturing it and where its origin is. But again, you don't really know the pathways of that bird. And it's a little more imprecise. So the genetic data doesn't necessarily get you down to the exact location the bird came from as you would a banding station, but can get you down to the region, hence the thicker line. Automated radio telemetry. Uh, this is MODIS, essentially, if, if anyone's familiar with the MODIS system that a lot of researchers talk about, putting nanotags such as on this Profana Terry Warbler. Uh, MODIS is basically utilizing an automated radio telemetry array. Birds with these tags fly past these towers. It basically is a ping, uh, and we can say that that tower detected that bird flying by within the distance that the tower can collect data. Uh, essentially, it is like banding data in a sense. It is very much stepwise, and we can say the bird was detected at these two towers or these series of towers. But in between, we don't necessarily know exact pathways that these birds take. We have other types of data that we brought in, including those using GPS, so global uh, positioning systems. Uh, this is the same type of technology essentially that you have on your phones to navigate for myself navigating from where i live in vermont to the site tonight uh, using the same type of uh, satellite systems for this uh, there's also uh, argo systems which are which are a different system altogether uh, but what these allow as you can see by the curve lines is these allow us to more or less see the pathways that these birds are taking you can see the actual flight paths that these birds take there's some imprecision in this, obviously, uh, but it's a lot more accurate and it helps us to understand their movements more accurately. And then there's light level geolocators. So the main difference between these types of technologies is for the GPS and satellite tags, those are typically put on larger birds historically. So things like raptors, waterfowl, the technology requires larger batteries essentially to help power that data to the satellites. And it's kind of hard to put a big clunky device on a bird like a sparrow or a warbler. Uh, of course, these are being miniaturized all the time. So we're, there's you know, some pinpoint GPS tags that can go on smaller birds. The light level geolocators are an ingenious little, very lightweight device. Essentially, it records light levels. So you can look at what time sunrise is, when is solar noon, these things are all calibrated, and by that, you can position on the Earth where a bird is based on how much sunlight it collects and what the hours of that sunlight's, uh, you know, kind of elements are, like sunrise and solar noon. Uh, however, it's very imprecise. You know, some of these tags have precision of something like 75 or 100 kilometers. Uh, so we can learn things about maybe where birds are originating, or maybe some general areas where they're wintering. Uh, but again, it can be uh, highly imprecise. I will say it's not part of this slide, but earlier this year, we learned a little bit more about uh, barometric geolocators, uh, where they can calibrate against uh, barometric pressure. And apparently it is extremely, extremely accurate down to uh, I think meters, essentially. Uh, and what it does is light level geolocators need sunlight. Birds that are typically skulky in dense understory or cavity nesting birds, uh, there can be some problems with getting the sunlight to help position them, but barometric pressure uh, allows researchers kind of new insights to species such as Swainson's warblers, which is where uh, there's a big paper coming out um, that detailed that. So those are the, the general types of tracking devices uh, that we've taken in. So for MBI, uh, for the tracking data um, for you know, the 458 species that we have on the Explorer, uh, we have, as you can see here, 9,300 individuals of 184 species with tracking data of some type has been submitted to our initiative. Uh, connectivity data. So 
The first is more kind of like the pathways that the birds take. Connectivity data, so banding, modus, genetic data. We have over 4 million points of data that have come into the initiative to help us not only map where birds are migrating, but try to conserve some of these places as well. And one of the major uh, points of data that comes in that we can't you know, state enough how important it is are things like eBird status uh, data, you know, the status and trend models data, the ranges, and also some uh, range data from BirdLife International. So those kind of help us paint the picture of uh, the ranges for these species. Uh, so some of your data, if you guys use eBird, uh, that has found its way into our initiative. So thank you for being an avid eBirder, if that's you. Uh, and then for the range maps, you know, we kind of synthesize this data. We also do an in-house uh, kind of validation um, that's done actually uh, in tandem with Jeff LeBaron, who Josh had mentioned, and myself. We're two of the, two of the folks that verify if the data makes sense. And then uh, as part of the Explorer, you'll see in a little bit, we also have some data on conservation challenges. So, you know, many of our migratory birds are facing challenges across the, the Western Hemisphere, obviously. Uh, so we have 19 hemispheric layers to help show how our birds are intersecting with a footprint of those challenges, uh, as well as conservation sites. So we have a large list of conservation sites uh, in the Explore as well. And when we do the live demo, uh, hopefully we'll touch upon all that. So let's talk a little bit about the Bird Migration Explorer. So the Bird Migration Explorer is a free online tool that you can access. I'll show you how to do that in the demo. It's available in English and in Spanish, um, which is extremely important when you think about getting the word out there to anybody that intersects with these birds. So Spanish-speaking countries throughout Latin America are very numerous, uh, and so we've, we've put it into uh, Spanish as well. I do not know if there will ever be a translation into French or Portuguese, but um, I think we will kind of see how that goes with what we can manage with uh, timing and need. So there are three main elements of the Bird Migration Explorer that I'll show you. Uh, the first kind of being our species migration maps, um, which kind of, as it says here, enhance our understanding of the full annual cycle to improve conservation efforts. Uh, these are really one of the flagship maps for the Explorer. Uh, we have an example up here of, of a Wimbrel map, uh, and we'll dive into all of this in a little bit. We also have location connection maps on the Explorer, which shows the places that our local birds depend on. It also um, really puts into context the hemispheric reach of local actions. So many of you, I'm sure, see conservation actions for places in which you don't live. You may see efforts out there to preserve uh, places in Alaska or efforts to work with places down along the Gulf Coast. And you may think, well, this is really great, but how does it really impact me? And I have to be selective, perhaps with my time, perhaps with my money, uh, and I want to protect my, my local birds here, first and foremost. Uh, these connection maps can kind of show you um, how your local birds are impacted by work in other places as well. And then finally, uh, we have our conservation challenge maps, which provide data maps to inform planning and policy. So here we have an example of Lapland and long spurge exposure to areas of oil and gas production. And these types of maps can be extremely, extremely important when we're trying to show how our birds are being impacted by some of the threats that exist on the landscape. So how can you help? And I usually save this uh, slide for the end, but I'm going to show it to you now so when we go to the demo, we don't have to come back. So uh, first of all, you can contribute your data. As I mentioned, if you are a birder, your data going into eBird, it's not just fun for other birders to see where the pink-footed geese are, or you know where the pin is for the 
Wakan Sparrow that we'll never find again. Um, these data actually do go into uh, research for many scientists throughout the Western Hemisphere, uh, and they get used in products such as this. If you can, volunteer with a, a banding station. Um, they can always use the help. That banding data finds its way into MBI as well. And then if uh, you happen to know anybody who's doing any tracking uh, of birds, putting tracking devices on, one of my primary jobs is to discover what studies are out there, what tracking data is out there, um, but having researchers be connected directly with us shortcuts some of that and, and really helps speed up the process. So you can contribute data in those ways, uh, even if you're not a researcher. Uh, you can, of course, use the Explorer. So hopefully after tonight's demo, you will all be really anxious to run home and load up the Explorer for some of your questions. Uh, so please use it, share it with any of your friends or colleagues that might be interested in it. Uh, and of course, what we really like to hear back is feedback on how you're using it or, or what you've discovered, or what improvements could be made. Um, we're constantly uh, looking to, to improve the Explore uh, throughout um, the process of it staying alive. And of course, connect with Audubon, connect with us, take action, sign up to join our flock. And on the Explore, I'll show you where you can check out uh, some of our learning resources. So that's kind of a, the overview of Audubon's Migratory Bird Initiative, the work we do, and how some of that data that comes in gets implemented into the Bird Migration Explorer. So I'm going to end the presentation for now. And hopefully, yes, take you to the Bird Migration Explorer. So on any browser, you can go to uh, explore.audubon.org. You can search in a search engine, Bird Migration Explorer, and it'll all end up here. Uh, so you know, things like Firefox, Chrome, Safari, any of your explorers that you, you typically use on, on your devices, your computers, your tablets will take you here. We also, uh, as of a while back now, um, have a mobile version of this. So the mobile version is a little pared down. It's, it doesn't have all the features that the, the main you know, browser type would on the computer, uh, but you can access it on, on your phone as well. And so this was launched in uh, September of 2022, so last year. Uh, so this is still uh, still fairly new, but just celebrated its, its uh, first birthday, as it will. So when you come here, the first thing that you see is our migration journeys map. Um, and this map here uh, shows the tracks of over 9,000 individuals of 187 species. Uh, so these are all the data pulled together. Uh, you can see, we'll go through it all during the presentation, but the map layers here indicates what you're looking at. So there's always going to be a legend uh, on every map to help you identify what you're seeing. So I'll point out a few things. One is the map layers legend, uh, which can collapse or expand. We have a data providers uh, panel in the lower right hand corner. We've gone through uh, extreme measures to make sure that all the data that were, were put into the Explorer are accurately cited uh, and accurately credited to the researchers or the papers, the data repositories, wherever the data came from. We want to make sure that that is clear when you're looking at a map. So this is a dynamic panel. So it shows you the, the data for what you're looking at. So these are two big panels that are important um, and then there's some other stuff that we'll, we'll go through as we, we go on. So when you first arrive here, you'll see that some of this is grayed out. Uh, you can click on, on the map, and it says, do you want to load an interactive map? Uh, that's generally a really cool thing to do, so we'll do it and see how the internet is here. Uh, so what this does is this makes this home page's map uh, interactive. So you can see all the data piling in, uh, and the first thing, again, you can see is all the colors, right? So this panel here for our migration pathways, we can toggle these on and off to show generally what we want based on some taxonomic um, grouping birds. So we have 
five main taxonomic groupings, land birds, raptors, shorebirds, water birds, and waterfowl. You can toggle them on and off as you like. Um, this map allows you to zoom in. So you can zoom in, you can pan around, and each of these lines represents the path of an individual bird. So as you hover over, you'll see some type of track pop out onto the map. So if you click that track, this is for tree swallows, it'll take you to the tree swallow map. Now, obviously it's a whole spaghetti plate full of data. So that may not seem too useful, but again, you can filter these down to different groups. You can zoom in as you need. Uh, the other thing to note about this is you'll see for the tree swallow that's selected a very wide kind of uh, gray outline. That's the journey of that bird from, from the data that's come in. The width of these data points as we show these indicate the precision of that data. So light level geolocators are fairly imprecise type of data. So you can see it's, it's rather wide because we don't know within that swath where that, that bird actually was. Uh, and you can see here for an American woodcock, that line is much more narrow, much more thin. Uh, that's a GPS uh, type of data, so it's a lot more precise. So you can, you can kind of just dive right in, click a species, have at it, and you'll be taken somewhere wonderful. Or you can kind of jump into a few of these other portions around the map. Um, so there's three main things that we're going to look at that correspond to the presentation I gave earlier. Bird species, locations, and conservation challenges. The Audubon logo, when you are on this website, is the home to this screen. So if you click the Audubon logo, it takes you back here. So that's, that's home. So we'll go to bird species first. So when this loads up, you're going to see there's a list of featured species. We have four kind of pre-selected. These are birds that have been tracked through some type of tracking data uh, that you can see when you click on their maps. You can also filter it down through any uh, various ways that you might want. You can you know, filter it down by taxonomy. So if you want to just look at shorebirds, you can do that. Uh, you can filter it down by your location. So you can put your location in by the data technology. Uh, this is really cool here because you can filter down to the birds that have been tracked. Um, and I'll get back to why that's important to, important distinction there. You can uh, look into conservation statistics so you can filter down you know, how, uh, how numerous these birds are. So the population size will filter it down by population, how vulnerable they are to various uh, climate threats. And then of course, our conservation challenges, you can filter down by various challenges that we've identified in the Explorer, such as you know, urban areas, wind turbines, uh, power lines, things of that nature. So there's no small way in which you can filter this down. You can also go through this list on the bottom of the 458 alphabetically, or you can select taxonomic and it'll put it into taxonomic order as well. So the one thing I want to know is that you see in the first four species here that there is an icon that says the bird is tracked. Okay. So that means, again, that bird has a tracking device that was put on it and we were able to take that data and bring it in to make maps with that tracking data. Other species, as you look below, American goldfinch, for instance, does not have that tracked icon. But we have other data in there to show their migrations and movements, and I'll show you an example of that as well. One of the things to remember when you're looking at all this, and I know this might be a little bit in the weeds, but when we approach researchers to try and get data in for our work, not every researcher who has tracked something shares the data. Not every data that's out there is available. So for instance, as an example, American goldfinch, there could be somebody out there who has put something on an American goldfinch. Just because you don't see it as being tracked doesn't mean that it hasn't been tracked by the researcher. It just means that we don't have any tracking data in the Explorer. So let's 
actually see what one of these maps looked like. I'll show you one of my favorite maps. Who here uh, really appreciates Broadway Pops? Does anybody, has anybody in the last, you know, we're into October now, but has anybody in September gone to any of the local Hawk Watch sites to look for kettles of Broadway Hawks migrating? Right? Yeah, just a phenomenal migration that we get to see in, in, in daytime. So Broadway Hawks uh, are an amazing migrant and uh, their maps are one of my favorites uh, for local birds. Uh, so as you can see, as the map is in motion, you have birds kind of streaming up and down um, throughout the map. You may be wondering, well, what are everything that I'm looking at? So looking at the map layers panel on the right hand side, you can see that the yellow dots are high precision, individually tracked birds. These are birds that were tracked typically with GPS tags or some type of Argo satellite tag. So their data is rather precise. Other maps you'll see some with kind of like this burgundy color dot, this purple dot. Uh, that's low precision. That's like our uh, light level geolocators. Um, and then some of the other things below, like the gaps in tracking data, correspond to over that data type. So when these maps come on, there's a bar that kind of comes into motion right away. That bar should always start in the week of the year that you're in. So when it starts up automatically, you're seeing where the birds are in migration at this time of year. This can be paused. So if you're wondering, well, geez, it's too much to take in, you can pause this. You can zoom in. And what we see here, besides the, the, the green range, which indicates the summer range for Broadway homes, you also see these brown abundance dots. These are eBird data that have come in. So the eBird data are put into kind of weekly increments that we are able to put into these hexagons across the landscape through time. So even if you don't have individually tracked birds, you can see where birds are migrating based on the checklist that have been submitted for that species at that time of year. These birds are changing, right? So we shouldn't really be seeing broadwing hawks at this time of year in some places like you know, around here. It happens, but large numbers of them, certainly not. Those large numbers are coming from other places. And so as people submit data for other places with more birds, that provides more abundance for that time of year. So these dots essentially think about the footprint of migration for that species through time. Now, what's really neat is you can pause this slider, you can move it around to whatever your desire is to see. Um, you can also grab the ends of it and expand it out uh, to whatever period of time that you would like as well. So here, zooming out, Uh, you can see it on the time slider on the bottom, I have it for the spring migration period. So what that does is that kind of shows you for the entire spring migration, what is the range of this bird. Uh, and of course, you can do this for any season that, that you would like. Um, and then what's really neat about this too is here's this data providers panel. Uh, so you can see how many individual birds, how many studies this comes from, and then of course, for anybody that deals with research, academia, you can see the, the, the studies that contributed to this as well. So really, really amazing to see this going on. So you can see uh, some really cool insights here. I'll zoom out a little bit. So you can see Broadway Hawks streaming through you know, migration, they're hitting places along the Gulf Coast, like Corpus Christi, they're coming through the river raptors in Veracruz, Mexico, and then eventually settling into places in uh, Western South America. Uh, and what's really neat about some of these, these types of things is when you have the data come in, sometimes you're gonna see the data going outside of the range uh, for the species. And there's a good chance that that might be a novel 
discovery that really hasn't been understood before. You know, places in South America, I don't know how many folks here have been to South America, I think about the Amazon, how inaccessible some of these places are. We, we don't have a sense of where some of these species go. And so looking at maps like this can help um, kind of illustrate that a little bit better. So tons of cool stuff here, uh, not to overshadow everything else, but on the, on the left-hand panel, uh, are some really neat things. So we have, you know, conservation statistics. So these are data that come in um, from places such as IUCN Red List, um, talk about climate vulnerability. There's related stories. Uh, so some some of our species have stories that, you know, there's an article published in Audubon. Uh, this broadwing hawk just happens to be uh, a species that I wrote an article about for Audubon. Um, about some tracking efforts. Uh, there's other maps that we'll kind of come back to uh, related to this species. So this is a gateway to these other types of maps for Broadwing Hawk. And of course, there's related links at the bottom. So if you want to learn more, uh, from the Audubon Online Field Guide or BirdLife International's Data Zone, you have that access there as well. So say you are really keen on this map, and you say, I really want to share this with somebody who loves this species, it's going to blow their mind, or I want to share this map with a student or somebody who's a decision maker or a policy maker. Uh, there's this share button here, uh, it's the kind of the up arrow on the right hand side, and you can copy a link directly for this map and share that with them so they don't have to navigate to get where you were, you can share this map with them. And specifically, uh, there's a little checkbox here at the bottom. It says include map specifics like current map view, zoom level, position, etc. If you click this, it'll basically take whatever view you're looking at, whatever presets you've kind of toggled on and off, and you'll share exactly what you're seeing with the person. So it's a really neat feature um, that has a lot of applications. So, this is an example of a, a species with a lot of high precision uh, data. Um, we'll look at another here, uh, kind of compare and contrast. So these are uh, bobolinks that have been tracked, another amazing species that we have locally uh, that migrate all the way down into South America. Uh, as you can see with the, the map layers here, um, these are individually tracked birds. There's one that has some type of GPS tag on it, it looks like, but these are low precision tags. These are the um, light level geolocator tags. So they're a little more imprecise, so we want to illustrate that. Um, you'll also see that there's this toggle here that says gap in tracking data. One of the funny things about working with geolocator data is that it's light driven. Well, during certain times of the year at certain places on the globe, you really can't use light level to determine your location. It's kind of, you know, it all kind of negates itself in a sense. So during the equinox periods around the equator, uh, the data doesn't really work so well. Uh, and so we, we show that by these gaps in data, uh, tracking data. So you can see where they kind of get ghosted out. That's kind of where we say, well, the data, we have it, but we can't be certain this is where they are. So we want to be is sure to, to show that. So that's another, uh, another type of a, of a species that you might encounter with a different tracking technology. So we'll go back home. Now we'll go to our locations maps. You can click this on the red on the left or you can click it on the top where it says locations. And you know we've gone through and uh, we've preloaded a series of really cool migration maps. Um, which I'll bring uh, one up here in a second. Um, but you can also search for locations as well, and we'll also we'll, we'll look locally. Um, all right, so we're, I was just talking with Corey about coastal Maine. So here is a map that kind of corresponds um, for all the data that we brought in, um, put into these hexagons across across the Western Hemisphere. So what you're seeing with intensity is the number of tagged species that connect locations. So the darker uh, 
the number, the more species in that that connect to other places. So just generally, we'll just take a quick look here on the left. Uh, you can see where birds have traveled from, from this coastal main site. You can see this is, is kind of uh, up in this upper right hand portion of the US. Uh, so you can see where, where are all the countries that this, this bird has, or birds have come from that connect this place, or where, where do they go? So of course the US makes the most sense. Uh, but you can see from uh, Bremen, Maine that uh, in you know, Canada, there's 87 species that connect that place somehow, either been banded or, or tracked. Uh, you can see like the numbers of, of species and the numbers of individual birds uh, that go all the way through. So you can see here, um, there's one bird of one species all the way down in the southern reaches of South America. You can click on this and it'll show you that this was a common term that has made that migration and connects coastal Maine to this place on, on the globe. Uh, so what you can do is you can zoom in, you can pan around, and you can take your primary site and then connect it to a secondary site and see the list of species that connects those places. You can also um, sometimes see when you first comes on um, the list of conservation sites that connect to that place and make uh, wherever our initial site is uh, as well. So it's a really fun way to see how your location connects across the hemisphere. So we'll go back, explore locations, I'll put in Hadley see what the map looks like for Hadley. So this is a map of the Western Hemisphere through the data that we've taken in that shows how Hadley connects through birds to the rest of the Western Hemisphere through the data that we have. As you can see, it's pretty far region, right? It's all the way up into the northern tiers of, of Canada uh, and all the way down uh, to the southern reaches of South America. And um, it's a really, really incredible way for people to understand the importance of their place in relation to the story of migration across the hemisphere. Final map type that we have on the Explore are our conservation challenges. Again, these are the maps that show the footprint of select human activities and environmental changes across the hemisphere with birds. We have kind of these big, broad tiers of things. Um, but then 19 kind of individual uh, conservation challenges. Now, uh, you may think conservation challenge, that's a unique, unique way of phrasing it. We chose not to use the word threat for specific reasons, uh, partially because for some things, uh, it might be a threat for one bird, but a benefit for another. So thinking about forestry efforts, you know, logging and things like that, might be detrimental to some species, but absolutely benefit others as well. So we wanted to view the, these types of things as conservation <laughs> challenges. And so there's all kinds of things that you can look at. Uh, one of the ones that I think is really important, uh, have you guys seen the news over the last, I think it's week or so, about the massive Chicago fallout, right? Yeah. Um, so if you haven't seen it, uh, I forget when it was exactly, I think it was the end of last week, Chicago, the Chicago lakefront, uh, saw massive numbers of birds falling out, um, probably in the millions, really. Uh, some people had peeper checklists of over 100,000 birds. Uh, they found massive amounts of um, dead birds in the city due to window collisions, uh, including at least one building that had over 1,000 1, birds, just one building, 1,000 birds that were, were killed from collisions. Um, so one of the one of the primary uh, factors sometimes with window collisions uh, is light pollution and how that can attract birds to cities and also uh, make it difficult for them to, to escape. So light pollution is a very important one at this time of year. Um, here you can see the conservation challenge for uh, light pollution and its footprint. Uh, you can generally see uh, 
you know, these are general numbers of, of low, moderate, high, and very high uh, for a migratory species. So where's the footprint of, of, of light pollution? It makes sense that most of the Western Hemisphere is lighter, and you can see some of those key areas, uh, particularly on, uh, you know, the, the Washington, D.C. to New York metropolitan zone. So we're going to choose a species here. So here's a list of all the species that are impacted by light pollution. And it's no small list, not surprising. We'll choose black hole warbler. We mentioned black holes earlier, right? <laughs> so here is a, a conservation challenge map of black hole warblers. My, as they migrate through time, more black hole warblers is indicated by a larger dot. More exposure is indicated by a darker color. So you can see there's also a histogram down at the bottom of our chart that shows for black hole warblers, Really, it's during the migration seasons that they're in, being impacted possibly by light pollution. But black holes, think about where they breed. They breed in the northern latitudes, they breed high in mountaintops. Generally, light pollution is not so much of an issue there during the summer season and where they're going into northern South America, likewise. But it's really during these key moments as they're migrating through that they're really interfacing um, with. with uh, Light pollution. So I'll zoom in a little bit so you can see this a little more close up and strain your eyes in the back. So you can see these birds, you know, they're down in the wintering grounds, now entering April, they're starting to come up, May. And you can see, you know, obviously the main areas. More birds, larger circle, darker dot indicates more of an intersection with that threat. So uh, if you want, you can go to this panel. So this is for black hole warbler. You can see there's eight challenges that black holes are facing. And you can see what some of these other, these other challenges might be. Now you might think, why does livestock management have anything to do with black hole warblers? Uh, some of these things obviously make more sense in wintering grounds uh, as well. And it's not just a northern hemisphere kind of bias. Um, but we can look, we can look at, you know, say, something else, say forest management. So, sorry for the kind of funny back and forth with Zoom. Touch a little sensitive. Um, so this is, this is uh, forest management. And so all these, these threats, you know, these all come from scientific literature, either directly where there might be a paper that says, this bird, this threat, here's the, the results. And we can say, okay, that's an obvious threat based on literature. We also have threats uh, that come in um, based on kind of these uh, extrapolations. So we might say, oh, there's a paper that details light pollution for black hole warblers. This is a hypothetical example. But we can safely assume that other warblers are probably going to be impacted by light pollution as well. So then they would get that threat if there's a biological match. Uh, so these are our conservation challenges maps. Now again, you can go back home, you can access these maps here through what's on the left, these red dots. You can access them across the top. In the beginning, for those who are like, I'm never gonna remember this, we have a tour that you can, you can start, take the tour, kind of preload some things as you're going around, kind of shows you how to do that. Um, there's also a link at the bottom left in blue, learn more about the Explorer, uh, but we can also go to the, the three bar menu here. It's also called a hamburger menu. I don't know why, maybe like a stack of hamburgers, I don't know. So the hamburger menu gives you more options. We'll show you that in a second. Um, and then of course, there's the take action, which is the Audubon link if you want to sign up for some of our stuff. So clicking on the hamburger menu, you have a whole whole suite of options, uh, particularly about the uh, bird migration explorer. And so when you come here, you'll see basically all, all the behind the scenes about how this was, was put together. You have a welcome page to tell you if you're gonna put the explorer or anything, how to properly cite it, who the uh, staff and folk were that were involved. Um, 
We have a supporters page, so who helped with some of the founding, who some of our financial uh, donors were. Um, here's our partners page, so if you want to learn more about the partners and the work that they're doing, it's really, really a great place to learn more about some really key organizations across the hemisphere. We have a fire hose of information here for the data provider stuff. So this is really, if you're wanting to dive into where the data came from, probably not applicable for most people. Someone is teaching, this might be very helpful to have uh, for anybody that's looking to learn more about the research. This is basically everything in one place. Um, I think when we put this in, so here's a list of all the institutions that have helped uh, where data has come from. You can see there's just hundreds of institutions. Uh, and then as you get down to the bottom, all the studies alphabetically, uh, way more information than most people would probably need, but very key information to have if you need it. I think these citations, I think to put it to Word, when we first launched this, it was like 70 some pages of citations. Uh, so it's a lot, a lot of data that's come in. More information about uh, species migrations, about the maps, the technology. So if you're wondering, what the heck is light level geolocator? What did he mean by MODIS? Uh, there's some information there. Uh, and then of course, for the various types of maps, so that's the species maps, the connection maps, conservation challenge maps. There's also some learning resources. So one of the things that I recently did was help out the bird migration explorer getting linked to uh, Audubon Adventures, which is kind of a uh, curriculum that is developed for, for young learners. And so you know, we have some, some kind of modules out there for, for young kids that we've just developed. Um, so how teachers can use this to teach young kids about migration and to get them thinking about the birds that they see and where they go. So there's a whole bunch of resources here. There's instructional videos if you want to learn how to actually use the Explorer again. I can't go home with you all, unfortunately, but we have some great videos on YouTube that give you the same instructions, uh, narrated very cleanly uh, and precisely by Melanie Smith, who's the program director for this. And then we have a, a page here for what's new. Uh, you can see the last update was just last month, and there's some, there's some updates here. So. That's the Explorer. That's kind of the overview of the live demo. Um, we've done the presentation on the MBI, and with that, I'm happy to take any questions uh, that you have locally or over, over Zoom. Well, this new system, how come you didn't know that those words are coming towards Chicago? <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's a really great, great question. You should have a system where you let the city know. So I, I believe, so what this system here is, this is more of a collection of past data to show you patterns of migration. I know, but didn't somebody pick up that block? That's a good question. I think the folks at BirdCast are actually the ones that would be better suited for, for dealing with that. So BirdCast use radar, live radar, right, to forecast bird migrations and predictions. And my understanding, and, I, and I'm not as adept at BirdCast, I don't work for them, so I don't know all their stuff, but I believe that they are working on trying to have, like, up-to-date live updates and so they can put out these alerts for systems that tonight's the lights out. I know a thousand of those were at the Chrysler building. What building? I don't know what the building was that was the main one. Now, why couldn't somebody have turned the lights off that night? Good question. I don't have an answer for that. Sorry. Well Audubon wants the same bird, right? I sure do. <laughs> They're not moving it. <laughs> Thank you. We have a question up here. Um, well, first of all, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I thought it was a very lucid presentation, and it looks like a very beautiful uh, tool, um, and, and probably quite addictive. Um, 
And uh, I, my, one question is, uh, I think I, and I, that I heard you say in the beginning that apart from like advances in tracking devices, there's also advances in data analysis. Yes. And now I did hear you mention a variety of other data sources apart from tracking devices. But so I, my question is, is there also such a thing as in the purely analytical advances in the analysis of that vast stroke of data? Yeah. So uh, this is a little out of my wheelhouse specifically, since I don't really do the analyses for these types of data. But I will say that for the folks who do the tracking themselves, uh, a lot of them are developing new analyses or using new, newly developed analyses that are done through R packages. So, you know, R Studio, famous from there, is kind of like a scripting platform. Uh, there's packages that have been developed that allow new analysis uh, through new statistical methods. Again, this is, this is where I start losing, uh, you know, credibility. But, um, so there are new analyses that are out there for those types of things. Whether or not um, we will go back through for any of that data is a good question. I don't know that we'll necessarily go back and try to have any new data reanalyzed ourselves. Mm -hmm. Some researchers may reanalyze their data, and if we learn about it and can access those data, we might be able to put those data, which are perhaps more accurate, into the system. So one question that wasn't asked, but often is, is well, how often do we update these data? So a lot of the data types are updated um, periodically. Some of them are going to be annually. So some of the eBER data coming in is updated annually. Uh, some of the other broad data types, the USGS banding data that comes in, millions and millions of points of data. You know, we're not going to you know, change that every month. It's just too, too much uh, computing time to do that. And it also costs money to update, update the Explorer. But we are updating some of those types regularly. The tracking data, um, so you know, I've collected some data you know, in the door that's not shown here. You know, we're trying to periodically update that. I think it's about every six months, you'll see some new data coming in. And we're hoping to kind of fill the gaps for some of the species that we don't have tracking data. Hopefully that answers some of what you're asking. Do you have sufficient data to help uh, in the understanding of vagrancy? Well, I, sufficient is a, <laughs> it's a good qualifier to, I don't know, to be honest, because um, I think that there's, you know, not a lot of efforts being done to, to track some of these vagrant birds, right? A lot of birds, their vagrants aren't targeted per se, right? Um, although I know that there's efforts for some, like for hummingbirds, hummingbird vagrants tend to get banded a lot. So somebody will see a, a vagrant hummingbird at, at their feeder. There's a whole network of, of hummingbird banders that will come in and ban that bird. Uh, but banding, uh, I forget the total amount of data in this, but it requires an awful lot of total bands to be deployed before you actually get re-encounters. I think it's something like 2,000 or some, some absurd number that you have to ban 2,000 plus birds to get one return uh, across all the, the different types of birds in North America. Yeah, vagrancy is a really interesting one. I, in this field, uh, I often see vagrant birds and I'm always curious about the drivers of those and wish that we could just Tag on everything, but obviously, logistically and you know, ethically, that's that's probably not uh, a good place to go down. Uh, is there is there another question related to the vacancy follow up, or is that well? Okay, but this may help. Um, I'm trying to remember the university now. There was we had a Sprague's pippin here um, a year ago, and when I was out looking at it, a guy arrived from I can't remember the university. It's just I think it was. It, Montclair State, perhaps, in, in northern New Jersey, who had extra money from uh, some sort of grant, and they gave him something like $900,000 to travel all over the country to look for vagrants. And so he's got, yeah. he's got data. Well, yeah, he, he would look for a vagrant, or, you know, it would show up on Ebers, and he would chase it. Yeah, um, but he's, so he's got data 
but I don't remember his name, or, or I think it was Montclair State. Yeah, so a lot of the data that's out there, uh, you know, we get from published papers, there's also repositories online where the data are stored. MoveBank is a great one. Uh, so we go to MoveBank and we look for data that's available there and, and take that data. And um, yeah, that's a really great thing. I, I didn't know about somebody kind of targeting uh, vagrant birds, but yeah. Yeah, first I just applaud the, the achievement of yes. wrangling all those data and, and creating such a beautiful product. Um, my question is, I mean, just related to that, you, you put together so much information, uh, I mean, really sort of unprecedented. Is there a science initiative behind this where, you know, in addition to sort of uh, the visualizations and where they're, you know, given how much stuff you've been able to pull together, looking for, you know, broader patterns and what kind of papers are, are, you, are being targeted and, uh, Sure. I'd be curious about to learn more about that. Yeah, so uh, really great question. So as I was mentioning in the beginning, the data that comes in for MBI kind of has two paths. One is this visualization path, which largely goes into the Explorer. The other is our applied conservation path. Um, and so in the early days of MBI, uh, I don't know how much of the tracking data was, was put into this because we're still collecting a bunch. Um, but you know, we used some of the data we would taken in to quantify how some places are valuable for bird migration. So some colleagues, I think Bill was a part of this paper, um, they looked at how many land birds are utilizing places like the Colorado River Delta and the Central Valley. And so, you know, with, 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 with migrations, right, we think about visual migrations that we can see, we think about raptors that we can count as they pass by a site, we think about shorebird sites where we can see all the birds pulled up, we can do counts aerial surveys, land, or land birds typically pass are a little bit harder to kind of do that with. There are morning flight stations, right, that do that. Um, but a lot of times these birds are, are migrating over, you know, our landscapes at nighttime. There are some radar data that is being utilized, but they use a bunch of data to kind of quantify how many land birds are using these areas. We're able to kind of say, like, here's the percentage of the Pacific, Population of this species, or its global percent of the percentage of its global population that utilize these areas in a way that's never been done before. So there's been some work like that. I worked with our partners at the Migratory Connectivity Project uh, to kind of do a essentially a meta analysis of the tracking data that's available, what's out there, what's accessible, what's not accessible, to kind of show like. Here's the data that's available. Here's the data that's out there. Where are the gaps, right? What species are kind of disproportionately not being represented? Uh, to try to kind of illuminate maybe where some efforts can go for people to pick up the mantle and start, you know, <laughs> tracking the birds. Um, and then most recently, uh, we're just starting up a paper now looking at kind of, uh, we'll see how it goes, but looking at the limiting factors on our warblers and what some of the, the impacts are for, you know, their, their population trends, uh, utilizing the data that we've, we've taken in. So, yeah, we're doing a bunch of work with the science of the data as well as the visualizations. Okay, well, I've got one. Um, yep. When you were running through the different types of data that go into the, uh, the Explorer, you mentioned uh, banding and modus as two types that would give you kind of separate disparate points, but not to the path in between, as opposed to the, the geo-tracking that could show you an actual path. Yeah. How common is it for the path in between the points to be something very different than a straight line? And are there species for which, are there some species that are much more likely to either go in straight lines or not go in straight lines <laughs> from, from one point to another? Yeah, that's a really uh, good question. Um, I will say that uh, by and large, like the modus data, right? Like if you have a ping and, you know, I don't know, somewhere along Great Lakes and then along the Gulf Coast, you don't really know what happens in between, right? There are some places where the uh, satellite, uh, you know, the, the stations are close enough in the array that we can kind of link those lines up a little bit better. It's a little more segmented. And we've been able to put some of the, some modus data into our animated maps working with Birds Canada as the, 
the partner who submitted and gave us all the MODIS data to kind of find out you know, how these can really best be, be mapped. So there are some, by and large, most of them are just kind of connection points. Uh, as far as like what species, that's a good question. I think we generally just did a blanket statement that we don't know, we, we, we don't want to infer uh, too far, so we kind of like left it off. But the interesting thing is, so all the data that we get in, they're all processed by the researchers themselves. We said, you're the researchers who track these birds, you're the expert in the species, you did the analyses, you worked with the, the analytical packages, we're going to trust your judgment. But invariably, we get data in that when you map it, doesn't really work very well. And sometimes the data that comes in isn't as clean as we would like. And so we have a team of people, uh, like my colleague Eric Knight and uh, Lotsen Taylor is not uh, thought about anymore, um, who kind of went through this kind of in-house, you know, kind of uh, data cleaning, as it were. And so what we did is we kind of put up some kind of thresholds for the data to map them in ways that biologically made sense. And so they, they had kind of these, these um, bounds on the data. So if the data, you know, if the point jumps too far, too fast, you would say, well, that's not biologically possible for that species. So those points can't work. Uh, we have points where if the data comes in at weird angles, it's like, well, that doesn't biologically probably make sense for what the bird's doing. And so those points, so we had a whole suite of kind of different parameters that we cleaned up the data, smoothed it out, averaged it out to try to give you, uh, you know, the best representation of the data that we have. So a lot of work on all fronts to get it to this point. That's interesting. You're, of our last four speakers, you were the third one to bring up modus towers as part of a sort of a significant factor in the uh, information you are presenting. So. Yeah, and, and, and modus is, is huge. There's a lot of efforts right now uh, to put up modus towers in places that don't have any. And, and uh, there's modus networks that are working in different regions. And one of the things they're trying to do is they're trying to create kind of these like fence lines of towers uh, so that way, you know, key migration areas, if a bird flies through, it's going to be picked up by one tower or another. It's not going to be missed. So, you know, think about like if you were to go through the isthmus of Mexico, having a string of towers going across the, you know, the, you know, the con uh, country of Mexico, from coast to coast. So as a bird flies by, it's likely to be captured. Yeah. I, I got in touch with the, the, I forget the exact name of the group, but the, coalition kind of coordinating placement of modus towers around the northeastern u.s and yeah. uh, there who connected with scott Wiedensall, and that's the topic he's going to be focusing on when he speaks to us is modus towers yeah and you can so. correct anything that i just <laughs> so. Any questions other questions here oh. I was just wondering if you had any conservation challenge data on the wildfires and impacts to birds and wildfires in Canada or Ireland. Yeah, I don't think we have um, we have any for fires. Uh, we so we have a whole um, threats matrix behind the scenes that drives a lot of this, and so we have some data in for some of that. Um, we don't have anything for for fires uh, currently in. In this, uh, but there are there are some. Um, there has been at least one paper I'm aware of. I think it detailed maybe the migratory routes of. I think it was greater what from the geese out west, uh, and how they manage the, the smoke and fires. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's a it's a I mean, it's a huge factor, right, for a lot of birds, not only breeding but also as they're migrating. Um, you know, how do they how do they work around? some of these massive fires. Uh, you know, our migratory birds, when they migrate at night, obviously they're using celestial cues, right? So if, if any celestial cues are blocked out, uh, that's one factor. They also use Earth's magnetism. You know, just, they suspect that birds can see what the, the magnetic fields are, and that orients them. I don't know how smoke would impact any of that, personally, but um, we don't have anything yet for, for fires, but it's definitely a 
wondering about um, over time, what's the plan for this as things change on the landscape? Because obviously you have a ton of data right now, right? And the landscape is going to change over time. Do you have plans for how you're gonna show you know, what's different today versus 10 years from now? That's a good question. I don't know that we have any plans for that per se with this. I will say that uh, you know, this, first of all, is a live product. We hope to keep it updated. You know, our partners at the Migratory Connectivity Project, they worked with us to help find, discover, and collect the data, and they're in the process of producing an atlas, a book atlas. Uh, I've seen some, some drafts of it. It's going to be a beautiful product. But that's certainly a product that's very discreet. Once it's done, it's published. You know, arguably, most people say when, when a book is published, it's already probably out of date, right? Uh, it's a little bit true with this stuff. We are planning to keep it updated. Um, as far as like catalog, like if you come back in 10 years and look at this, you know, are you going to see what it was? I don't know that we have a plan for that. I will say that Audubon does have some climate uh, predictions that show how birds will change with their, their ranges uh, based on different uh, warming scenarios. Uh, whether or not that gets integrated in, I, I'm not sure. Um, as you can imagine, it's a lot of work just to get to this point. Um, this was about four years in the making. Um, so yeah, so all good questions and suggestions. Yeah, I saw that in the list of um, conservation issues um, invasive species I'm wondering is that invasive birds like starlings or is that more invasive plants and could you use this data to see how um, say bittersweet or something like that affects bird populations good question uh, as you see here at the bottom of this there's no visualizations yet for invasive species so we haven't mapped that yet inside the threats matrix uh, we have you know it's kind of a nesting hierarchy of, of things and so for invasive species i think it's parsed out into you know animals and plants and things like that um, primarily like a lot of that right I think in the literature that I've, I remember seeing, a lot of that is for seabirds, which we don't have mapped in our explore. It's one thing you won't find is seabirds, largely due to logistical reasons of trying to map birds from a different hemisphere and how you know, there's, there's some GIS logistics primarily for that. Also, eBird data isn't quite the same out in the ocean, uh, so you can't really project it across the landscape in the same way. Uh, but a lot of the invasive uh, species kind of literature is out there is many times for seabirds on islands, uh, primarily for things like rats, goats, you, know, you name it. Uh, mostly, uh, you know, kind of invasive, you know, land mammals. Um, but yeah, there's there's a whole description here that you know you can read that tells you about what what's kind of uh, in place for this. But I'm not sure when. But hopefully, we'll have uh, some visualizations there. Um, and the thing about bittersweet, uh, you know, just makes you think about the uses of the explorer. Like if you want to kind of make a case for something for your local region, there's a lot of opportunities here in the explorer to show how your place is connected to other places, why it's important. So if there's a local conservation issue that's happening, uh, you know, we fully expect that this could be a good tool to add to your arsenal of making a case of why something is, is should happen or shouldn't happen uh, based on you know whatever you decide for your birds. Yeah, that's interesting. I'm just thinking that, um, I mean, those invasive species you mentioned earlier of you know mammals on islands, things that have a negative impact on bird populations, but where Henry mentions bittersweet, and you get that, you know, certain bird species with a more positive relationship with bittersweet, that the data you've got here could say, if we get a new invasive plant species that has fruit that's popular with a migratory bird, the explorer could be a tool for predicting where that invasive plant is likely to show up as the bird's eating its fruits or you know, carrying them around. Yeah, I think there's a lot of opportunities. One of the things that we decided when we built this is this was a great tool for birders, bird curious, and conservation minded folks. We kind of went through a whole process of what could this be? And one thing we realized is 
this can't be everything for everybody. So there's a lot of opportunities that we probably could do. We'll see in time if, if they happen, mostly because, you know, the whole jack of all trades thing, we want to make sure what we do, we do, we do well. Um, and who knows if that's something we could do well or not. Any other questions? Anything on Zoom, Dan? Good. You think the people on Zoom are really paying attention? Are they all like, at home, <laughs> We're at home smoking them. pot and eating Cheetos? <laughs> we'll, we'll quiz them later. I mean, if they're smoking pot, they should be jealous of the cookies we have in the snack table. <laughs> <laughs> I was really glad Donnelly asked her question because it gave me an excuse to go back there and grab it. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, thank you all for coming tonight. Can we get another round of applause for that? And um, yeah, so uh, I guess folks here, if you could help hang up your chairs on the, the rack there, and uh, I'll, I'll keep working on uh, getting a confirmation of our speaker for next month, and I'll let you all know, I'll put it up on the website and all. As soon as I'm, uh, I'm certain that they're coming. So, thanks everybody. Talk to you next month. If not soon. Thank you everyone. Thank thanks you. for coming. Thanks for your insightful questions. And I hope that this provides some sense of kind of a renewed sense of joy about migration. And there's still a lot to discuss. So, please use the explore. Uh,